Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association Wisconsin Counties Association Wisconsin Realtors Association Marshfield Clinic Health System and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel Maggie Turnbull of Madison is an independent candidate for governor. The election is November 6th. Maggie, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you so much for having me. You're a newcomer to Wisconsin politics, so give us the short version of your bio and any sp specific issues that triggered your run for governor. Sure. Um, I'm an astronomer. I um, am born and raised in Wisconsin, born in West Dallas, and most of my family lives in the Milwaukee area. Um, my family, we moved up to Antigo, Wisconsin. My dad was just starting his medical practice, and at the time, the state of Wisconsin had um, a program where they would pay for, for people who couldn't afford to pay for medical school, the state would pay for it in exchange to going to set up practice in underserved areas. So we moved up to Antigo, Wisconsin, um, and my dad has been working ever since um, for the last 30 plus years um, in the Antigo area and at the, on the Stockbridge Muncie Indian Reservation as a family practice doctor. So after I graduated from Anago High School, I went to UW-Madison for college, um, where I majored in physics and astronomy. And um, after that, I went to Arizona in Tucson, the University of Arizona, and um, got my master's and PhD in astronomy and cell biology, a minor in cell biology, because I was interested in life in the universe. <laughs> Um, so from there, I went to Washington, D.C. and worked as a, a fellow there for at the Carnegie Institution of Washington for three years. Started um, a tenure track job at, in Baltimore at the Space Telescope Science Institute where we run the Hubble Space Telescope from. Mm. And decided that, you know, this is, this is sort of the job that you, you are trying for when you go through all of your schooling in a field like that. And I felt that um, having actually gotten that job that, wow, I really just want to live in Wisconsin. <laughs> it's my home. Um, so I took a leap and everybody said that it was a little crazy. There's no such thing as a freelance astrobiologist. Um, but I, I did it anyway. I moved back to Wisconsin and I started my own nonprofit, the Global Science Institute, and began um, rebuilding my career use, um, as an independent contractor, basically working with NASA. And now I'm I'm, you know, just as um, busy as I ever could have could have hoped to be as a scientist, um, running teams all over the country um, in NASA's space exploration program. You didn't want for things to do, starting <laughs> your own firm and going around the country. So, tell me about your the origin of your interest in pol in Wisconsin politics and the decision to run for right. the state's top job. Yeah, well, when I moved back to Anago, one of the reasons that I chose Anago specifically to move back to um, when uh, reimagining re my science career was because the community was familiar to me and I knew that I would have a good relationship with the public school and I knew that I would be able, I really had a strong desire actually to connect with the farming community. That was a really big factor in that decision because um, Antigo is the home of the Antigo silt loam, and you can see it. I always say I could find my way home from space because you can see it on satellite maps of, you know, this deposit, this 10,000-year-old uh, deposit of Antigo silt loam has all been carved up into potato farms. <laughs> and I felt that there was really a beautiful opportunity there for somebody to move back and actually contribute in a, in a very uh, noticeable way to their community. I thought about Madison, but I was like, wow, there's already so much activity here that you know, I could probably throw myself on the flames and, and nobody would hardly notice. But in Antigo, there was a lot of, 
there was a lot of community stuff that was kind of ready to start really coming together with the skills and the talent that is already in that community. So I threw myself into building a farmer's market too. And so for a couple of years, that was, you know, along with the astronomy and stuff, that became my passion, you know, just to learn from the farmers, connect with them, see what kind of opportunity there was to do direct business with local people right there. If any place in the world should have a farmer's market, it should be Anago, Wisconsin. And now we do, and it's still running now 11 years later and, um, and thriving. And it makes me so happy to be able to come back to that every year. But I also decided to run for city council. Um, you know, in a lot, of, a lot of cities, the idea of taking public office is a pretty high bar. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard, hard to get name recognition. It's hard to even get your foot in the door. But in Antigo, I felt like this was something that I could do. So I went out and I got my 20 signatures. <laughs> to <laughs> little, be on the ballot? A little different the from the council? governor. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, um, and went door to door and talked and introduced myself and some of my ideas and um, unseated an incumbent and was elected. And then after that, another young person decided to run for office and got elected. And I had this sense that, you know, there's really there's really a lot that we can do if we all step up to serve in government at any level, whether it's city council or county board, but all of these offices were really meant to be circulated through, they weren't meant to be held onto by one person for 30 years. They were meant to be circulated through the regular population, the working population, people who are busy with careers and families and whatnot. And they were not intended to be, um, you know, celebrity appointments or um, th or positions that could only be attained with hundreds of thousands or tens of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really felt, you know, through that experience and then serving on the council for the next four years that um, this is something that I enjoy participating in. I like being in. Um, a negotiator role where there are different viewpoints at the table and I'm able to see you know the valid points that people are offering and then create a policy together that we can live with and build on going forward. Is there any one issue that triggered your run for governor? Yeah I think the one yeah absolutely the one issue that triggered me to want to run for governor is that I just really wanted to see somebody on that ballot in November who is a peacemaker, who is very much standing on that beautiful middle ground that we have in Wisconsin. By and large, our the thing I love about Wisconsin is that we are a people who is very kind to one another and we do work together really well when it comes to one-on-one -on -one interactions, neighbors, relatives, community groups, we do a lot together, even though we have so many different viewpoints. So I wanted to make sure that there would be somebody on that ballot who wasn't um, immediately pegged as being really right, far right or really far left. Really so you found too much polarization absolutely. in the traditional parties. Way too and much that's, polarization. And that's the reason you chose to run yeah. as, a, as an independent. Yeah, so I was serving on the city council at the time when um, Scott Walker was elected. And as we all remember, there was so much, um, so many hard feelings <laughs> for the next few years after that with the protesting and um, the way that um, legislation was enacted and has been enacted, it has in many instances left half the people in the state feeling unrepresented or marginalized in some way. On the other hand, you could imagine the pen pendulum swinging right back and having somebody in office who does the same thing, but for the other point of view of the state. I just want to stop that pendulum from swinging altogether. <laughs> stay I in the really middle. <laughs> I want to stand. Compromise. Yeah, I want to stand for the middle ground. I want to restore civil discourse to Kay. our legislature. And um, it may well be that the only type of leadership that has credibility in that realm is somebody who is straight up independent. And for me, it was not, I didn't even consider running as a Democrat. I just, my voting history and my political leanings throughout my adult life have not, I've never identified as a Democrat, 
but I definitely uh, resonate with certain things in the Democratic platform, but I still resonate with certain things in the Republican platform as well. Okay. L l let's work through a, a, a few sure. issues here, which you as governor would have to deal with in your next budget. Um, do you think um, our public schools are adequately funded, Maggie? No, I don't. So <laughs> you'd, in your budget, then, you'd put uh, a dramatic amount more into K-12 funding? Yes, I would want to look at how the funding is allocated. I think that we have a little bit of a balancing act to do so that um, the, you know, the schools that are extremely underfunded can be bolstered a little bit at the expense of schools who are getting a lot of the funding. So I want to balance that out a little bit, you know, for example, between more wealthy suburban districts and more poorer urban or poorer rural districts um, to try to balance that out. But I really want to see us with um, a strong public school system that has manageable class sizes so that um, kids, when they are emerging from our K-12 system, mm -hmm. they're actually qualified to do stuff, like real things. <laughs> you know, and in, I would like to see more partnerships between, and we are doing that, I'm aware, um, but we, I want to see more partnerships between especially high schools and local businesses or the technical college so that students who are ready can start really learning a trade and um, beginning, begin getting their toes wet with the experience of what it's like to run a business or participate in a co-op um, and come out of the, the K-12 system ready to roll um, and not just only qualified for the bare minimum lowest paying jobs. Do you support the, the choice and voucher program that allows some students the option of going to private schools with the state paying their, their tuition? Right. I would, I think that what I'd like to do there is um, look at look at <laughs> how we can maybe gradually phase that out or um, limit how much money can be transferred into the, the okay. voucher system. Okay. I'm not opposed to people wanting to send their children to private schools. I mean, and in some areas, you know, very long neglected districts, it really is a legitimate concern that, you know, I don't feel, maybe I don't feel my child is even safe at that school or they're going and there's no way they can learn and here I have a, a private school and the only way that I could afford is through the voucher system. So I think there's some instances where it might actually be appropriate to, okay. to you know, not just drop the hatchet on that right away. End it right away, yeah. I understand. What about the impasse over how we pay for highways and bridges in our future? Uh, how, how, how should we fund <laughs> our highways? Right. Uh, well, right now, so we're, you know, as of course you know all of this, but we're funding our highways through gas taxes and registration fees. Yep, 92% um, of it. Yes, comes so from, from 92%, right? And what I think uh, we want to look at, again, with all parties at the table, um, <coughs> because I, as governor, I would not sign something that is represents to me a tyranny of the slight majority. Mm -hmm. I want to see consensus on anything, any bill that gets passed, any law that gets passed. Um, but with all parties at the table, I want to look at the costs, who is, who's really, you know, doing, taking the greatest tolls on our highways. And I think we know that it's, you know, it's the big trucking systems that we have um, and that we need. And by no means do we want to drive them out of business or anything like that. Um, but they're taking the biggest toll on the roadways. Um, I happen to own a Prius. I don't know if I should admit that or not, but I actually really enjoy that car. And my registration fees just went up yes. because yes. I don't, I don't buy enough gas <laughs> to pay for the roads. Um, but never mind the fact that you know my little car is putting hardly any toll on that road at all. Um, so I want to kind of look at user user fees, registration fees, and see um, if there's a way to shift the burden a little bit towards um, those vehicles that are do it putting the greatest damage on the road. And the <laughs> the discussion of tolling, your thoughts on that? I think it would be a. Uh, to be honest, my intuitive sense here is that we just don't want to go there. I, that is based on my own personal experience with the Illinois Tollway oh, right. and um, the, the trouble that 
is that comes into even trying to implement as, and then maintain a system like that. You end up with a lot of overhead just trying to manage a toll system. Um, and I, I'm not at all convinced that it results actually in better roads. But I would like to look, I'm very interested in looking at how we build our roads and whether we can do this in a way that um, we're investing a little more in materials and, um, con and con design that can stand the test of time for longer so that we're not continually in the situation of having to repay, repay resurface roads Kay. that aren't standing up to the the elements and then if we you know liberate some workforce from having to continually work on resurfacing roads we could use those people to do other important things like widening culverts that are not big enough for the streams that pass through especially for these you know hundred year floods that we seem to get every single year now and um, you know or building wildlife underpasses so that we can minimize the number of car deer collisions which is a, a huge percentage of the accidents that we have on our highways right with, now with the uh, tragic ba tragic backgrounds of school shootings and mass shootings do we need to change gun laws i think well we definitely need to have wait short waiting periods you know i think a two-day waiting period is completely reasonable that's not going to stop somebody from going hunting and it's been shown that this will help with suicide prevention or acts of anger, uh, acts of violence toward other people. Um, I don't, I am not going to fall on my sword over um, recreational use of weapons that, um, that, aren't, that aren't relevant to hunting, but I do think that we need to be very careful about who, who owns those weapons, make sure we've got thorough background checks, reasonable waiting periods. Okay. Um, the $4.5 in uh, potential state and local tax incentives to Foxconn, was that a sound, was that a s good public policy? I would not have been in favor of that. At this point, we are, we have a contract and I think we need to really look at uh, realistically how that, how and whether that can be changed. I'm all in favor of businesses coming to Wisconsin. What troubles me about this is that we're putting so much taxpayer investment in it, and it's all our eggs in one basket, and they're not a Wisconsin-grown business. So they uh, are now such a huge investment for us that if there are other laws, you know, we've already overturned all the environmental restrictions for them. If there are other laws they don't feel like following or other, you know, other um, incentives that they want to stay, we're always going to be at their beck and call. We're always going to be beholden to them lest they leave and take all these jobs with them. So it's too many eggs in one basket and I would I would love to take all that money and invest it in our, our smaller Wisconsin owned businesses. Even if it doesn't result in 13,000 jobs all at once, what you're doing is you're strengthening communities and making it easier for people who already live here and already want to be here to stay here and grow their businesses and their relationships with each other. So it's more diverse and it's more robust. Two of our prisons, Wapan and Green Bay, were built in the 1800s and we're closing the two juvenile facilities up north. Um, there's going to be a discussion of building a new prison. Should we? State prison? Let's let's look at the costs of this, but I really, you know, the the what just troubles me very deeply is that we're spending more on corrections now than we are on education. We, you know, so this is a this is a complicated picture, but the way I see it, we have to look at laws that are, you know, putting people in prison for victimless crimes. Usually those laws penalize the poorest people and the, the minority, you know, people who are minorities and poor the most. And then being in prison sets them up for a lot of trouble for the rest of their life, just the fact that that's on the record. And it, it clogs up our court system mm -hmm. so that we have to, I mean, it's just a very expensive project. So I would like to overturn laws or change sentencing laws so that we don't um, have such an uh, an enormous population of people in prison. Um, if we're in a situation right now where the aging facilities that we have are inhumane places to keep people and and, and too expensive to keep 
running or to repair to the point where they are reasonable places to keep human beings, mm -hmm. then yes, we will have to build a new facility. We'll have to figure out how to do that. But this is part and parcel with um, changing our, our laws so that we're not uh, throwing people in jail who do not need to be there. Traveling with that issue is the issue, uh, traveling with that subject is the issue of do you support recreational marijuana or medical marijuana or both? I support both. I would like to see marijuana uh, regulated and taxed the same way that alcohol is. I don't want marijuana to be available to minors and we can't have people operating vehicles while they're stoned, but marijuana is, um, is not much different from having a couple beers. Funding the UW, we've had six years of a tuition freeze on resident undergrad tuition. Should we continue with that freeze into a sixth and seventh year? I'm sorry, seventh and eighth year? I don't think raising tuition um, is going to help us <laughs> going forward with the UW system. I would be in favor of freezing the tuition, but we're, you know, we're, we are in a situation where we do need to bolster the funding for UW or find ways of cutting costs so that we're, we're still providing a very quality product to students. And I'd like to explore um, remote learning between, so we have this wonderful network of colleges in the state of Wisconsin. And it's a, it's a tier, you know, you have UW and um, Milwaukee, UW-Milwaukee, and then you've got colleges all over the state. And each one of those colleges is kind of known for a slightly different strength. And I really would like to see those colleges play to those strengths. At the same time, we need to be able to offer a a real breadth in education to students who are going to those colleges. So if they go to UW Stevens Point, it's not just to learn about natural resources, they also need a broad worldly education. And I think with the combination of um, bringing in more remote learning opportunities so that if a student is at one place, they can still be taking a class at another university. Um, I think we, there's a lot of unexplored territory there that could be developed at, at not such an exorbitant cost. At a f as a former member of the Antigo City Council, levy limits, do we need to get rid of them, loosen them, or keep them in place? Gosh, I'm really in favor of local control. I'm very in favor of local control, and I understand um, that uh, people don't want their property taxes to get out of control, but on the other hand, you know, it's been a while since we've done the experiment to see what happens when we allow people to make their own decisions financially at the, at the local level. And so I'd, I'd be in favor of moving toward that again. Rural health care. Uh, in rural areas, you have uh, older residents, you have young people leaving, you have government, Medicaid, Medicare providing for more health services. How do we keep and maybe improve health care in the rural areas, please? Well, I want to make sure that the state of Wisconsin is receiving all of the federal dollars that accepting and receiving all the federal dollars that are available to us as a state for programs like that. And, um, you know, the rural areas in some ways are very similar to the most urban areas. They're underserved and they have a whole host of health problems. Um, but I do want to make sure, I mean, in rural areas, we have a lot of problems with opioid addiction. We have a lot of problems with teenage pregnancy. We have a lot of problems with diabetes. Um, we need to really have strong education programs about, uh, for that, rehabilitation programs. Um, and again, hand in hand with that is making sure that we have really good women's health programs, including reproductive health um, education and easy access to birth control. Um, I am saddened by the um, decrease in funding for Planned Parenthood. That's something that I think was so beneficial to our state, and I would like to see that bolstered. Does the state have a role in retaining and recruiting doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals? Yeah, well, I did mention that, you know, my, 
my own dad has his career to thank um, yes. for or his a program like that to thank for his career and I that you know that program's not around again anymore but I would love to see that happening where you know you want to go to medical school you're from the state of Wisconsin you've shown some aptitude in college we'll pay for you to go to medical school and and in exchange go and set up in a, a rural area or a community that really needs you yeah. and that's I think that's a fair it's a fair exchange and a very rewarding um, way to serve. Um, dental care, uh, medically underserved residents. There's a program uh, funded by state government and Delta Dental that provides preventive checkups to children. Some of, the, some of these clinics are struggling financially because of Medicaid reimbursement levels. In the next Medicaid budget, should it ex continue the program and expand it? Yeah, I, I would like to see, um, you know, once we make sure we're getting all of our federal dollars okay, that we can through the expansion. Getting, yeah, I would love to see those dollars go into making sure that all children have primary care, including dental and vision. Okay. Um, as an independent contractor, you know, since the day I moved back to Wisconsin, I've struggled with health insurance for myself, even finding affordable health insurance for myself. And really, at the end of the day, as... Um, you know, somebody who isn't struggling with health issues, I just want access to the basics. You know, at least at least let's have that available for all children and really eventually for everybody, just basic health care, dental, vision, and checkups. And that, that would be a wonderful place to start. And maybe a final question. You explained why you couldn't run as a Democrat. Um, what, what are your differences with the Republican governor, Scott Walker? Well, um, I think that I am more fiscally conservative than, than Scott Walker is in the sense that I really want to be careful with where our tax dollars are spent. I want transparency, I want accountability, and um, to see deals like Foxconn going through these big giveaways of taxpayer dollars, um, that does not strike me as very conservative or very um, fiscally responsible or conservative approach to building the business community. And I have also watched our deficits go up every year for the last eight years in the state of Wisconsin. I find that very alarming because it's going to be the next generation that has to pay that all off. And I want to see this state um, economically, fiscally sound for many generations to come. So that, that's probably my biggest difference from Scott Walker. Um, however, I also do, I have to say, and you know, I, I've had Republicans say this to me too, that while we're, you know, we're very, we're Republican in the sense that we're very pro-business, what it still burns us to see the environment being degraded so badly um, because we're not following even our own laws, our own envir basic environmental protection laws. So environmental protection and fiscal responsibility, those are the two big ones for me. Okay, thank you. Maggie Turnbull of Madison is an independent candidate for governor. The election is November 6. Maggie, thank you for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you so much. Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel.